Kia ora, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm sitting here with my friend, Matt Manukuo, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Mate, it's, it's awesome to have you here. Thank you for having me, bro. I, um, this is the first time in ages where people have told me, before this guy goes, you need to get him on. Uh, and then there's just been a bunch of people who have come through finding out that I'm going to have you because I'd like to go around, you know, ask different people, what do you know about, you know, is there anything that we'd like to bring up? And everyone, like, with, without flinching, has just said, talk to him about his story because he's got an amazing story. Uh, and then I got to see you do the takeover for uh, your pizza as well. And it's just amazing. Like, the, the stuff that you, you go through and, and just such a, I guess, a humble way of putting different things. But then, you know, you have so much that makes you you. So mm. I'm very privileged to have you. Yeah. Uh, and I think a, a really cool spot to start at would be these stories uh, and, and, <clears throat> and the earlier challenges that you've had to overcome to get here. So if you don't mind just elaborating on what I'm going on about here, that'd be awesome. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thank you, Troy, for, for having me on this podcast. I'm a big, big fan. Oh, man, uh, I As I mentioned it. before. Um, yeah, so... My story is quite quite complex uh, in my life. Uh, so, um, brought up in a small wee house uh, with my five brothers and um, and my mum and dad, and we come from a heavily influenced rugby league um, household. Right. So, with that, uh, rugby league was a, lo- a big part of my life, and um, yeah, uh, throughout my the junior years, uh, I played at the uh, Best club in, in New Zealand, the <laughs> mighty Manabit Lions uh, in central Auckland. And, um, yeah, came through the, the ranks up there and um, got to, you know, captain my team a couple of times, got to make a couple of rep teams and, um, and yeah, just go through the ranks. And rugby league was, was my life, you know. And a lot of my, my personal being and a lot of my personality traits were centred around rugby league mm. and, and my captaincy. And, you know, some of my mates even now still, like, like tease me about it, like, oh, man, you know, and... Uh, you, you used to spray us back in the back in the day, and and would just listen, and would you know want to um, make it up to you and, and try and win for our team. So that's something that I always um, that I always held close to me. Just you know being able to lead a good bunch of boys on the field. So rugby league was a was a core part of my life. And um, in 2015, it was a when I was the captain of my team. I, I got Player of the Year. I got to represent Auckland. Mm. Um, and you know everything was was going really well for me, and um, and uh, I was on on track to sign with a NRL agent just right. to get me set up towards uh, signing with other clubs, and mm. you know get the stream underway, and and that was my main that was my main focus at that time uh, was to become an NRL star. Sure. Um, plan B, C, D didn't didn't matter because mm. Plan A was was rugby league, mm. um, and that was because of the. You know, massive history behind my family, uh, the massive history and interest for myself, mm. and um, yeah, I found myself in 2015 at the end of the year, uh, December December through to January, <clears throat> I was I started to um, feel sick, fall right. sick, and I started to have uh, headaches, and I started to sleep all day, I started to um, vomit like all the time, and and I'd wake up with you know massive pounding headaches mm. and. Um, and my migra- and that which soon turned to migraines, and I'd sleep, you know, twelve hours, wake up, and I'd still be dead tired, and and I was just, I didn't know what was going on, but I thought it was the fatigue from that whole year of rugby league that mm. that got me. So, um, yeah, I think in in January, uh, I believe the whole the whole month of January, every single week, we were going back to the doctors. We will send me back with, you know, um, different medications that help with the uh, nausea, help with the headaches. Mm. Uh, each becoming more stronger and stronger that sent me back and you know I'd love like don't want to sound like, sound like that but I loved you know getting all those medications because I, I was thinking that would help me get better sure um but it, it didn't you know and I think it was yeah at the end of January January I was at school and we just started at school and I was looking down at my um at the table I looked up at the board and then pitch, like black wow and I and I couldn't see a thing like I, I was I felt like I was going blind, right. and I was going blind. And I told my mum, I said, "Mum, you know, I'm I'm going blind. I think." And um, she said, "What do you mean?" I said, I, "I just see black. I can't see." It was in um, I was in moments, you know, where where I just see black. So they took us back to the doctors, and then I told the doctor that I saw black. So then that's when um, she did a wee assessment on me, told my parents to send me to the hospital, and then an ER. 
me and my dad went and my mom I uh, came from work later on and and I was thinking I was like oh yeah finally they're gonna they're gonna you know figure out what's going on with me I'm gonna um, get out of here by tonight get some medication go back home start training again mm. get ready for the year and um in that space in a space of of 12 hours I'd say 12 hours um from when I got into the hospital um, to the next morning. The next morning, I was booked in for for emergency brain surgery. Wow. And um, and yeah, it was it was quite it was quite a a revelation for me because you know that's in that moment my life literally tur- turned upside down. Mm. And um, yeah, I remember hearing the news that after a CT scan, they they found a mass in the center of my brain. It was about the size of a a walnut um, sitting on my pituitary gland, um, right deep within my brain and you know I still remember um like the oh it's you know I still remember the the sadness mm. from my parents at that time mm. uh because you know nothing you don't hear we don't experience this stuff sure. other people experience this stuff but it never happens to us yeah this type of thing so yeah uh in that morning I had emergency brain surgery uh, to relieve some of the pressure that was building up because of the tumor that was blocking in my brain mm. um and then they took a wee sample of it, and we went. Uh, we and I went back home, recovered. I'm like, oh yeah, sweet, all good, no worries. I'm gonna, I'm gonna heal from this, get back on the field, and and get cracking again. Yeah. Uh, so we got back into the hospital. Um, they called us back to hear the results of the tumor, and then they started discussing plan treatment plans with chemotherapy. Right. And I was like, chemotherapy. Mm. Yeah, that's that's people. That's for people who have cancer. Yeah. And I asked my mum. I said, mum. It's not. I don't have cancer, do I? And she said, "Yes, yes, it is cancer." So, um, yeah. Then my whole family was in the, you know, th- the room, and we we're all discussing treatment plans. And I was just sitting there, you know, silent. And I was just like, "Shit, what's what's going on?" You mm-hmm. know. And um, so yeah, that was a that was pretty much the start of of my journey. Um, and from then on, I, I went through uh, four cycles of chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twelve sessions altogether, and yeah, each 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 of the sessions got worse and worse for me um, in terms of my tolerance with it, um, and also a lot of you know psych- uh, mental and, mm. and physical uh, distress that I experienced during that time, mm. uh, which was quite tough for a fifteen year old. Now for that sure. I think about it, um, obviously I was missing out a lot of the experiences that my friends were at that age in mm. the early early teens. I was missing out on school. Uh, my brother who had just become the deputy head boy at our school. So I couldn't be there to uh, to be there for him, first of all. But second of all, I couldn't be there to, you know, be proud of him. So I had to, um, you know, hold that in. And my rugby league career, that went straight down the drain. And, and that was a big part of me. So mm. once I lost that um, and it, wasn't, it was out of my control, I was left, like, bro, it's like as a 15-year-old, I was left to question you know one my mortality but mm. two also two what was next mm. sort of thing and that was quite tough for me and my family but you know a lot of those thoughts I usually kept to myself mm. um because I still didn't know how to how to quite comprehend the situation I was going through you know I was I was in Starship Hospital having chemotherapy with with babies you know with, with cancer sitting in children sitting in wheelchairs um and they're all, you know, everyone's bold. Everyone has no eyebrows and all that, and it's it's quite it's quite depressing. So I go from this rugby league background. I'm training with the boys. We're all happy. We're all healthy. Then flipped, you know, and I'm now in a hospital with with sick children. And mm. I myself was a sick ch- a child. Um, yeah, and then so went through chemotherapy. Um, at the end of chemotherapy, the tumor that was supposed to shrink because of the chemo, it didn't. It stayed the same. Yeah. So when I heard that it stayed the same, I was like, like "Damn, yeah, are you, are you serious?" Like we went through all that chemo, and I went through all that struggle, and in my mind, I'm like, "This is January all over again." Mm. Like they didn't, they sent me, they advised that this medicine will be will, will heal me, but it didn't, and I was just, you know, I was I was defeated inside. But obviously, I didn't want to put that onto my my family yeah. because they they're trying to help me through it. Um, and yeah, so they decided to operate on it. Um, and they had a talk with me and my parents. And to be honest, I did, I didn't really want to 
do the operation. I was really scared because it's it's obviously brain surgery. Sure. And one like small mm. mess up, paralyzed, dead, mm. blind, all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, but we ended up um, talking through it and, um, yeah, we had set a date for the 9th of June 2016. So everything up until that point, uh, I was I made sure. Oh, I believed in my in my whole heart at the time that that would be the day that I that that I was like done. Like I was, mm. that was my the date that was going to be written on the side of my, you know, headstone, bro. Yeah. yeah. So, um, as a 15 year old, yeah. like, shit, like man, that's so hard to to fathom, and I I feel sorry for myself now, listen, thinking about it, but. Mm. So everything up until that point, I'm like, oh yeah, sweet. Um, it's gonna be the last time I see my my family. It's gonna be the last time I spend time with my friends. It's gonna be the last time I'm in my house in my room. Um, yeah, and and come to the the morning, and you know I'm I'm in the um, I have to have a shower. It's like six o'clock, and they give me a special antibacterial um, shampoo to to scrub my head to right. just make sure it was clean. And I was like. Fuck! How depressing is that, man? Just in this big, um, in this big hospital bathroom, and I'm just getting ready to, you know, see my the inevitable mm. end for myself. And um, you know, I was, I was, I was okay with that. Um, I was okay with that being the end for me because everything up to that point, you know, I did the best I could. I went through all that chemotherapy. I lost everything that I had to live for before so if th- that was the end for me um that w- i would have been content with that okay like shit bro that's you yeah know, that's that's real stink for a f- 15 year old to to think about and you know go into the, the hospital room um say say my last goodbye to my family and you know get well done I, I couldn't find myself to cry because uh, i was i was okay with the situation sure. i was like you know all good um and I brought my my older brother and Trent um, to come into the hospital room just to help me uh, before I went under the uh, anesthesia, mm. and you know, go into the hospital room. They were put me on the bed, and uh, it was just this, this big room under these bright lights. And um, chucked the chucked the mask on, started injecting the anesthesia in me, and you can feel my body go 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 numb and numb and 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 limp and um, and in that moment. That's when I felt like I needed to cry. Yeah. And I let out one last, you know, love you, bro, to my brother Trent. Yeah. And then I was like, man, this is it. Um, I'll, I'll see everyone on, on the other side. And, yeah, and then um, eight hours later, I wake up in, in the post-op room and and I can feel my mum holding my hand and kissing my, my face and, and my family. I can hear them around. I was half conscious, but I'm like, shit, mm. I woke up. Mm. Like it's and then from that moment there, bro, uh, I, I knew um, that it's not over. Like yeah. my story's not over. I'm still supposed to be here for some reason, whatever that reason is. I'll mm. figure it out from the from that day forward. Um, but yeah, and and yeah, that that's pretty much my my story. Bro. That's yeah, that's bro. unbelievable, yeah. and like. Because, I mean, if, if, if we think about what you're doing now, and if I was to meet you now and, you know, only see the stuff that you're doing now, I'd just be like, oh, man, you know, this guy's pretty driven. He likes doing what he does. But that puts a lot of things into context. And there's just a few questions that I have about it because you told it like it was just like, you know, it, you could go through it and I guess reliving it sometimes. But it feels like you've you've dealt with it a little bit. You know, you've, you've, you've seen it as something that's, I kind of mostly a positive and that you've grown from that but you know during that time as a 15 year old you know because I I thought the world revolved around me as a 15 year old you know I if I if something like that any any minor inconvenience to me and I'd be like why me this is oh everyone's just out to get me but yeah. this is actually a point where you're starting to feel like you know life or death like literally life or death yeah. um in the parts leading up you know you're going through the chemo yeah. and you're not allowed to where you can't be the child that you thought you were going to be, you feel like your dreams are going down. You know, when you were kind of getting the doses and being in that new environment, you know, you're now surrounded by four walls and and it's a weird, airy feeling in hospitals. You know, did you just feel like, you know, giving up or did you always have that hope that there is going to be, you know, I'm going to be putting my boots back on? I guess at the start I was um, 
I was hopeful that I could uh, put the boots back on, back on. Obviously, because that was the start, everything was new. I was like, oh yeah, sweet um, chemotherapy. It's all good. Uh, it's just a little bit of sickness. I can I can keep up this pace for the for the remainder of the treatment. So um, yeah, at the start, you know, I had uh, three sessions of chemotherapy and. Um, and the side effects didn't get me that bad. It was not until the the latter part, so the yeah. third and the fourth. So the third one, I started to sleep through my chemotherapy uh, infusions, and because uh, I couldn't stay awake. As soon as I woke up, and I was sitting there, and you know, it's, uh, if if people don't know what chemotherapy is, it's like um, it's like a drug that mm. they they pump in through an IV line. I had a wee port right. um, just that s- sat underneath uh, my skin here, and it connected to the I can't remember what the, the um. The main vein that connects to your heart. Sure. So they they plugged it in there, um, IV line that machine next to me. Yeah. So I could wheel it around the right. the ward, and um and yeah, I'd sit there for for three four hours a week mm-hmm. just having that um, and yeah, it wasn't until the the last three, uh, actually there was a moment in the at the end at the halfway through my third one, uh, my third chemotherapy session when I told my dad we're in the and the uh in the car park of a at pack and safe and I told my dad I said dad like I, I don't want to do this anymore mm. like I, I've had enough eh? and my and you know my at first my dad didn't know what to say because what do you what do you say exactly. to a, to your child who's facing cancer and and these things are out of his control um so I felt real sad thinking about back to it uh, for my dad and what he'd think mm. and I didn't want him to tell my mom because my mom would be even more upset right which would make me upset too so um, yeah, so definitely towards that um, that end where I felt like giving up, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what giving up looked like at that time, sure. but I just knew that giving up to me felt like you know I've done everything that I could, um, and and I can't you know stay awake through this this chemo if it's not shrinking, because mm. um, they told us it wasn't shrinking at the at the end of the second round. Then what's the point of 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 going on, you know, mm. and um, and yeah. I guess that that was the main point. So I didn't really see a light. So I like I truly believe that once I woke up from that surgery, bro, that's that's when the the f- the flips are the, are the, the switch, switch flipped. flipped. Yeah, yeah. So for me, and then that's when I knew, uh, and I started building myself back up and up mm. and up. Um, there was actually a moment where I was in the hospitals uh, post surgery. And I heard of a little, uh, a younger boy, he, I think he was about 10, 11 years old, who just had the same surgery that I had at the start of my training. And um, and he didn't he didn't want to talk to his mum or his family, and he was just lying there, and he was quite sad. So I told the nurse, I was like, oh, you think I can go and have a word with him? They said, oh, yeah, yeah no worries. We'll just ask his parents. Parents said, yep. Yeah. Walked in, and um, and then I just sat with, uh, with the boy, and I just, you know, um, he had the same, tish, uh, same, um, Plasters on his head that I had yeah. at the start of uh, at, on, after my first surgery, and I just sat with him and I, for like half an hour, just chopped it up with him. Hey, bro, how, how you doing, man? And you know, I had the exact same thing, and I showed him my scars. And um, at first, he was a bit like, "Hey, who's this guy?" Mm. And then after I showed him my scar, and and I re- and he realized that um, I was similar to him. He like his eyes lit up, and he started to talk to me more, and he started to laugh, and I started to crack jokes about you know. People bringing in food. I said, bro, when people come in with with uh, with, with food and lollies, bro, it's like make the most of it, man. <laughs> like <laughs> people feel sorry for you, man. You gotta <laughs> you gotta like you gotta take advantage of that. And he started he started laughing, and then you know I, I took a photo with him, and by the end of it, um, you know that that made me feel like, oh man, mm. like, this is this is why I'm here. This yeah. is why I'm still here. Man, that's awesome. And then just describing, so I know it's probably almost impossible to put into words, but you know, the, the last feeling, so you, you explain it and I could almost see it like it was a movie, but like, I guess the euphoria or, or whatever it is that you're going through, only you could describe and only you could ever like have that feeling inside you and know it. But you know, to have that distinct contrast between I'm going under, this is it, to you know, almost being reborn again. Like that, I don't know if that was the feeling you had, but when your eyes did open up again and you gained consciousness and you could have those senses again, like if you were to explain that to someone, what were those? What were those feelings? Man, yeah, just like you said, it, it was quite euphoric. Looking back at it now, um, yeah, it was. Uh, that's a hard, quite a hard question to to think about and to put into words, but. Um, 
I guess I can I can put it into like some adjectives, you know, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or some like, you know, one of the main things was that came the first things that come up to mind um, after that moment I woke up. That was like first it was purpose, yeah, like purpose, like I'm here for for a reason, and I'm still here, like yeah, and I have a purpose now that from this day forward I need to um, live a life uh, that is worthwhile for for all those that have helped um, me with that journey. Uh, to that point and second of all i guess um love man like like for real like i was showered with so much love and i i truly believe that that's what what woke me up you know the the love and the prayers of all my family and all my friends that were on my back um throughout my journey that you know sat around my my bedside that's that's why i i woke up you know um and I also owe it a lot to my my own faith, mm. my faith in, in God for for a greater plan. Um, you know, I didn't really understand what what that meaning meant before I um, before I was sick. Mm. You know, I'd always hear it from my older brothers uh, who who went to church, and um, he'd always you know come tell me that you know there's always a greater purpose, greater plan. I'll just trust in it. I said, oh, bro, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. And then once I woke up, you know that that greater plan that you know everyone talks about. Yeah. Um, with a connection to their faith as is, is, is that experience and body man that's unbelievable man that's so cool and I, it's 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 funny because like my come before I found out all that you know I thought I was just going to get you on you know you did you did your degree and and you're doing cool stuff you know you're a photographer like you have all of this stuff and you're working for media things I was actually a little bit scared I was like oh I'm getting an actual professional <laughs> and to you know talk while I got this little nah, little podcast thing going <laughs> but you know that's I think like I said before, in terms of giving context to the drive that someone can have, but also, you know, I think it gives you a greater a feeling of, of gratitude for those who get you there. But also, you know, you have a stronger drive to give back uh, and you live that in the sense of, you know, actually where you're going to end up going. So you go through the rest of high school, I guess, as this person who, you know, has been through that. And that's something that's bigger than what most teenagers are ever going to go through. You go through, and then from there, I'm guessing, you know, ideas and, and the love for rugby league is still there, but it's just in a different capacity. Did you ever think that there would be something in terms of a role or uh, something that you pursued that would get you back on that path, or was it just like something different after that? So yeah, that was a really good question. So in my, in my um, the year after I was sick in 2017, I played under 16s um, back uh, with with the Manabit Lions, and that was my first time, you know, fully getting back into training. Um, getting back into you know being around the boys and um, yeah I played two games for throughout that year. Uh, one game was just a uh, you know last minute fill in. Sure. That was my first game back ever. I was against uh, Mangere East. We got pumped that game and you know, <laughs> <laughs> but then I I found myself as soon back into that captain position. So I took the boys straight up, um, afterwards to the side and I you know sprayed them. I said boys you know fuck, that's not good enough mm. you know. That, that's not who we are. We train our asses off every week and, you know, we need to come back better, bigger and better. Um, and then my second game that I played was against Otara, um, in Otara. And, uh, yeah, in that game, um, I started, I think I started second row centre, which is my us- usual position. And I think it was in the second half where um, something happened in, in one of the tackles I was chasing a ball from one of my mates who who grabbed it through and mm. all I needed to pick up the ball and, and score the try but um, I didn't see the fullback coming across and then once the fullback came across bam yeah. hit me and then um, I couldn't I couldn't stand up so I tried to stand up you know as you do I was like oh fuck you know, yeah, nothing yeah. Else. I'm, I'm trying to stand up um, and then you play on play on to the second half uh, during that second half and then some another player comes in just dives straight up my leg hurt a pop Oh. And then um, afterwards, yeah, heard a pop, and I'm like, Fuck. and then I just see this big fat ball on my knee um, afterwards. And uh, as a, a funny thing too, just a side note, uh, I didn't tell my mom that I was playing. Right. My mom didn't want me to stay away from rugby league just because of you know my sickness is too dangerous, and I didn't tell her. So we we went behind her back, and then <laughs> we went to go play. Me, my dad, and my brother. I'll call them out on the, on that. Uh, it was a joint. Joint decision, and then, um, yeah. So, anyways, uh, uh, I was real sore, and and I had a school ball the next week. Oh no! So, 
<laughs> so I told you know my my cousin that I went with. I was like, oh man, I, I probably can't come, but I ended up going, limping around as you do, and then I uh, had a wee scan on it and completely tore my ACL. Oh, and I'm like, shit, man, maybe that's the sign <laughs> that it's that's it's a no go. And um, yeah, so I had knee reconstruction surgery, and yeah, I guess from then from then on that at that point that was my sign. I was like, oh yeah, sweet, nah, no more. No more rugby league. I'll, I'll move on to this next thing. Um, fast forward to to year thirteen. I was blessed enough to become a prefect at, at Avondale College, mm. which is one of the biggest schools in, in New Zealand, and um, and even more humbled to go into great honours and, and be the head boy at my yeah. school. Um, and then with that, with that being a head boy, came a lot of speeches and came a lot of opportunities where I could, you know, leadership opportunities. Which you know sort of steered me away from that path of rugby league. So, um, you know, towards more helping people and connecting with people and, and relationships outside of you know sports, which which I started to take interest in. I was like, man, that's really cool. And um, and I heard I heard someone else, one of the other uh, one of the uh, inspirational talkers that I listened to that, uh, which is a similar experience that I experienced. But he said that he got the same feeling. Um, getting ready for a speech that he got when he was in the tunnels waiting for his game. Wow. So for me, I got that same feeling before I went out into assembly to deliver a speech to the, the student body mm. that I would uh, in the sheds before the game with the boys. Wow. I'm like, man, I could like I could get used to this uh, this sort of stuff. So yeah, played a, played another game in year 13 and um, got concussed in that game as well. And I just told my dad, I was like, nah, like, <laughs> I'm done, I'm done. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll happily take that and um and move on. Mm. You know, at least I know I have uh, I have strengths outside of rugby league now, and um yeah, and another uh, another good thing to point out is before bro before I was sick, I was shy as, as right. I never talked this much, bro. I, I never talked. I never um wanted to connect to people. I was real introverted, so I wanted to keep. I still carry some of those traits now, but I was I still I wanted to keep to myself. Yeah. So. Um, after rugby league, you know, talking and and connecting with people and getting out there is something completely different to my character. But um, that's something that that I attribute to the to the journey. Wow, yeah, because I mean, a lot of sharing it. So we always used to say like matauranga is not matauranga unless it's shared. Mm. So like you can have all this wisdom and you can have all these different things that you've been through, but it's until you share it. And that's kind of the philosophy behind this podcast as well, is that we all go through so many different things and. And until you share it and until someone else gets to experience it and be part of it, does it actually become, you know, proper knowledge? And, you know, you were talking before about that that excitement that you would get before you'd go and do a speech. Like where, wh- what is it about it? Is it that you're knowing that you're going to go out there and, you know, address a bunch of people and hopefully change something for them? Or what was it about it that gave you that buzz? I think it, it- it enticed the same feelings that I had when I went into that room with that younger boy. Right. When I went into that room and, and just by having a little conversation with with uh, just being myself mm. and, you know, being my you know, chippy, uh, fun self that I was able to connect to him, even though we're at different ages, we're completely different, you know, and they were complete strangers. But if I could, you know, connect with him through just being myself and just talking and, and expressing myself, then I knew that, um, going into bi- into bigger rooms with people, or with a lot of different people, um, with a whole lot of you know a whole large group of audience. If I can be myself and and sort of express myself um, through you know giving speeches, through you know um, doing doing that sort of thing, public speaking and um, and sharing my story, then I I, I could hopefully get someone in the crowd to have that same feeling that that younger boy mm. had uh which you know leaves me feeling like oh man as long as i um if i am able to do that which you know countless times people have have come up to me and, and appreciated the things that i do uh that uh, like the messages that i've shared with them but i'm like man it's you know that's it's it's a part of it yeah um it's it's a privilege for me to share that that information and that um those messages with you so i'm glad that that they take something out of it and and in, um, in year thirteen, I used to do the thing, uh, weekly speeches at at school, and I used to give um, give quotes like quotes of the week, yeah. just from you know random quotes of the week that that I listen to from you know my favorite inspirational speakers or you know some some from like authors like mm. Dr. Seuss for example, and, yeah. and um, I'd make it a, a weekly thing, and I think 
uh, early in the year or end of last year, I heard that you know some of the students that are still there now, uh, they still remember the, the quotes <laughs> that I do during that time. So you know things like that, bro. It's like yeah. you leave you, you leave a mark on people, and, and they'll um, they always remember uh, some little things that you, that you mentioned, and that's that's what like that means the world to me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then some of that. So, did was a lot of that kind of like the drive between behind a lot of what you went to in terms of your study? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, so funny thing, I I studied, I, I enrolled at the uni doing a BSci and in, in mm-hmm. psychology, just because I wanted to stay in that sort of realm of of um, mental health and and um, brain function and all that. It's too hard. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> right, you know, right, I didn't right. connect with it at all. I was more of a artsy person, so. Um, switched to communications and yeah. then uh, with communications I loved it uh, in first year and I connected more with the subjects and I connected more with how to or with what we were learning and then um, yeah and then I think it was last year that I sort of uh, shifted towards wanting to do journalism mm. yeah and um, which you know helped encapsulate all, all the things that I, I was interested in um, but also you know helped me uh, hopefully as a career to help other people share their stories about their lives and yeah. and you know I love writing as well, and um, and yeah, it just helped me. Like my job is sort of similar to what you do on podcasts: just go and talk to people and, yeah. and hear their stories, and then chuck it on a, an article, or chuck it, um, record them, and, and chuck it on a, on the radio for news bulletins and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just yeah, that's that's how I um, how I sort of connected to my degree. Yeah. Sure, and we'll talk about the so we'll talk about the job. The jobs that you've had from your degree and just like you know because you said you get to go talk to people and then I just want to talk to you because I don't really talk to people who do this sort of stuff oh, okay. so yeah, I'm yeah. like quite <laughs> interested in how you find the process yeah no but, worries so what, what are you actually doing for work to be able to go and do that so I am a multimedia journalist for the Pacific Media Network cool. which is based in Auckland um, pretty much what I've been doing is covering a lot of the South Island stories so Pacific stories from the Otago region mainly from up in Omaru, down to Invercargill, mm. and just contacting people through there, and, and also Dunedin as well, and um, co- contacting people through there about what the what the work that they they've been doing. So, yeah, that's sort of the stuff that I've been doing. So through that, I've been able to cover stories of the Pacific students in Dunedin and their work, mm. um, the Dunedin, but through Pacific Trust Otago and, and some of the work that they they do, and. Um, you know, vaccination clinics, you know, church openings down in Invercargill and and uh, community work that doesn't really get that much coverage um, coverage down here for, on a national level. So just being able to give that perspective of Pacific people down in Otago has been something that, that I've been able to connect myself with mm. uh, through this job. So, yeah. And uh, it's funny because uh, one of the bosses at my work uh, met, met some of the people, some... Uh, some people at this at the it was a ball in Wellington a couple of weeks ago. Okay. I can't remember what it was called, but when she told people that she was from Pacific Media Network yeah. from the South Island, they they are straight away asked like, <laughs> "Oh, do you know, do you know Matt?" <laughs> um, yes, yeah, because and then she just said, "You know, I, I tell people uh, our partners and some of our um, other people that we connect with that Matt's the South Island um, correspondent." So mm. yeah, so I, I, like that's a humbling title for me, and and that just shows you know. I still carry on that that same thing that I still can connect to people that I still can make inf- like leave people um leave people remembering something that I've done. Yeah, for sure. And that's so like just something that I, you you've touched on is that you had uh, inherently introverted tendencies. Yeah. But you would get the same amp like you'd get amped up to go and talk to a huge crowd of people. You also, as part of your job, it's a ne- it's a necessity that you're connecting with people because mm-hmm. I'm exactly the same. Yeah. I like when I tell people that I'm like I would rather go be by myself than have to be social all the time. Mm-hmm. No one believes me until they get to know me and they're like, oh, actually, you are introverted as <laughs> like you you this this is tiring for you." Yeah. But you know that buzz that you get that you spoke about. Mm-hmm. It's a weird thing because you know that it may not be. It may not be the best thing that for you, but you know that fulfilling feeling that you get because you've you've made that connection, and maybe you're the only one in that moment who can bring something out of people. Yes, yes. So when you're you know when you're going to do these things, do you have to amp yourself up? 
before you get there so like once you're there it's fine it's yeah. like this right now it's mm -hmm. easy but the moments before it or like do you have a ritual to get yourself into the zone <laughs> oh that's funny bro yeah the funny that you mentioned that because i did the exact same thing before i came to, to this today i was like <laughs> man trying to amp myself up so yeah i have a have a sort of a process um uh, because like as introverts do you sort of question if you want to go yeah. like when you have an opportunity it's like oh man should i really should i go to this or or not or or should i you know should i just cancel or <laughs> um when i have big speeches or i have to go to a party or something i was like oh man i'd, I'd rather stay in my room and, and just mm. not and just isolate myself which is a bloody so not a good thing to do as an as an introvert but um <laughs> yeah so pretty much my my ritual I like to listen to either like I got a play, Spotify playlist like with hype music and nice. try to hype myself up, uh, or I listen to you know some of the the old um, motivational speeches cool. that, I, that I used to listen to and that you know hearing hearing the voices you know talk about um, get your life together you yeah, know yeah, yeah, all that yeah. sort of stuff it's it's like man I'm like oh I yeah. gotta I gotta get up for the 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 occasion so yeah things like that um, yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah, yeah. Cool. So yeah, it's the same thing. We're like, you can be so good at it in the moment, and everyone's just going to assume you're this natural. But like, it actually takes a lot of energy and effort to be able to get you to that point. Yeah. But then once you're there, you're, you're shiny. But then, do you find after that you like are quite taxed? Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely, definitely, bro. And and I, I guess my after after those you know speeches and all that sort of stuff. Maybe five ten minutes afterwards, you know, after everyone's come up and congratulated you and and, and thanked you, I'm like, oh, I'll just you know, get away from me, you know. I, I just want to um, have time to myself. So then I, I um, after those things, I usually you know, try and try and go find a space by myself or walk away for a bit and just trying to reflect on on what just happened and mm. and try to think about you know what did I say right, what did I say wrong. Obviously, I'm um, I'm gonna think about all the stuff that I I should have said, but then. Uh, reflect on the stuff the good things that i did say and and hopefully um and hopefully reflect on also the the feedback that i got from the people that have been listening to me so yeah all that bro, is like yeah man it's it's so tough so afterwards yeah i just like like you said it's, it's quite taxing so i just like to have maybe you know some more time to myself just mm -hmm. to just to kick back and and center myself back to you know my normal operations cool. out of that out of that mindset yeah. out of that um you know sort of frame of mind that i was to get me prepared for that opportunity mm. and, and speaking yeah yeah no that's awesome and i think having that sort of process and knowing that you go through that because i remember the first times i noticed it happening i was like what's wrong with you like <laughs> everyone else is fine yeah, and yeah. then i'm just like no this is just the way you operate and then you have it and something that i really like that you said is that you know, you don't get too caught up on the things that you should have said. You just think about the positive stuff as well um, while, you know, thinking about that feedback. Something that, you know, comes to mind is that when you are sharing these stories and when you're doing communications, you know, there's that element of creativity. Yeah. And for you, have you always been like what you would consider a creative person? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so uh, um, in terms of, of creativity, uh I'm a bit of a poet as well. Cool. So I did a do a bit of spoken word poetry, which is inspired by my older brother Trent, um, who did you know we open mic nights for a small collective they have up in Auckland, and you know and from then that's when I was able to connect you know all these thoughts that were in my mind and 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 put them on paper and you know try and um, try and express myself through all those all those different creative ways and that that was my first um, experience of creativity. So I was never usually like that beforehand, bro. Yeah. Like I was. Um, I didn't know how to control my thoughts. I didn't know how to how to write, how to be creative. You know, I just wanted to. I was really direct and really, you know, um, prim and proper and, and clear and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And another another mode of creativity, I guess, is my photography, yeah. which is um, which was something that was also bought bought to me um, when I was in the hospital. Right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I was I was in the hospital one morning with my with my dad, and it was post surgery, and uh, it was about six o'clock, and I and I took a chair and I just took it to the window. Um, oh, the hospital bedroom, and there was a, the sun was rising over the city, and I just you know put my phone up, and I just I was like, oh man, that looks really cool, mm. and I just took a took a photo of the sun rising, and I still have that photo on my phone today, and uh, yeah, from then on, I was like, oh man, I, now I see like the beauty of 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 life and. Mm see the beauty around me so then 
um, it slowly built from there and I just started taking photos of every, everywhere I'd go. If, if uh, any of my friends or my family are, li- are listening now, they'll know that uh, when you're walking around with Matt, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no moment where I won't, you know, take my phone out and, sure. and take a photo or something. So, yeah, and then that's, um, and that was, you know, I focused into my uh, Instagram page, mm. which is the the Urban UN, yep. which we'll probably talk about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I which which you know helped me uh, center all that creativity and all those photos on my phone and and all those expressions of creativity because uh, that I wanted to share because I was able to share those photos that I love taking with some of the quotes and some of the key messages that I wanted um, people to to know about. It was sort of like being able to share a different side of me yeah. that people wouldn't know uh, about at, at, at first glance but also you know some of my friends and, and family and stuff that follow that page they did they wouldn't know um that i was you know capable of of doing that sort of stuff you yeah. know photography and and um and sort of those those messages in, in that page so yeah it sort of gave me an opportunity to focus my creativity and um at times i'd chuck some of my, the lines of my from my poems into those um, awesome into those posts and stuff yeah but uh that's awesome, man. That's a, it's so cool to have like creative outlets like that, mm. and to be happy exploring it. And I think you know to to be able to share that with others. Something I really like, and, and <laughs> you said it, and I I got like that. You know when I, you know when you get your first like oh, iPhone, and it's c- kind of takes send me good photos, and you're yeah. like oh, this is me. Yeah. And you, so like anything that you see is, and you you just like we'll take a photo of maybe like some bush and then you're just like that's really nice and you actually start appreciating <laughs> really cool things that you yeah. just walk past all the time because now you're taking time to you know soak that environment in mm. when you were talking about your page and it's it's been something I've always been quite curious about and it's that the use of the word urban yeah but also yeah so urban UN is yep. your, so you're also new in and yep. you're proud of that as well yes. and um and I do I love the flag. I actually, mm. you know, I think New Orleans has some of my favourite oh, people. Bless. It's also one of the nicest places, um, I guess, to be able to v- go visit as well. Yeah, it's yeah. nice and quiet, but nah. Um, but, you know, that word and, and that title for you, was that something that you just like, oh, that's a cool thing, or is this a long-standing thing? Uh, to, be, to be honest, there was, a, there was a couple of name changes at the start, or name ideas at the start. Yeah. Um, so how it, how it came about was myself and my cousin, um, Unique, who goes by the name of of Eris of the game. She's a musician, right? Um, and, and now and and also my cousin Hannah, who were my flatmates at the time. We we're doing a wee, you know, planning session about our lives, you know, in, yeah, in, yeah. In th- two, three years, and how it looked and how we could, you know, center our creative abilities uh, into sorts of um, into you know, not alter egos, but sort of like another another um, personality or another, you know, social media. Um, uh, a front that you could you, sure. know, you could put on. So, yeah. So, Urban UN came about because we live. Our flat is right in the center of of the city, right? Dunedin, so, just like right in the in the urban sort of area, and and also in Auckland as well, uh, where my house is is in a, um, a small area. It's like called Oaraka. O- right. So it's right in in Manaba. But it's uh, in central Auckland. So we lived, you know, in the in the urban area throughout my whole life, and. Mm. I'm connecting those two things, I was like, "Oh man, that, that has a nice, you know, we ring to it." So I, I'll connect that with my Nguyen heritage, mm. which I'm very proud of, and uh, come together and and bring that together. So yeah, I don't, uh, there's a there's quite a lot of uh, the, now there's um, a lot of Nguyen creatives that are coming out on on social media. Uh, my brother is one of them who who does you know t-shirt designs and and also um, ha- yeah he has his own clothing line where he's able to to produce all uh, new way and designs and mm. and get that um out into the market which you know new ends because we're such a small nation um and a small population that you know things like that uh, like those you know being musicians being creatives being artists being photographers being you know people that do public speaking yeah. not really something that that um would would make a sound compared to all these other larger islands For so sure. being able to connect myself as a new way into my photography page um was something that was 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 key to you know my identity uh, mm. as as the urban Nguyen. so uh, um and as a Nguyen in general so that when people hear the name urban Nguyen, like they know like that's that's yeah. Matt you know? yeah 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 oh, that's awesome and I think uh, something that you touched on too a, a really cool thing is that you get to explore further mm. and you keep keep exploring and you keep expressing and um I think having 
physical some physical things of of your expression at different times I always find awesome because you can go back and look at the different times and what was influencing you at different times so you yeah. can go back and you're like ah oh, that's when I was in this phase <laughs> yeah. uh, so like it's bad for us older people because we yeah. go back and you know you look at your Bieber <laughs> photos and stuff you're like ah oh, this was the sepia phase <laughs> like all that stuff yeah. but you get to go through and see you know what was of interest for you Definitely. at different times and you know that identity part that you're talking about you know with yourself being a creative um, you know, is it when you when people bring up cr- talking about cr- creativity, you always bring up the term you know authentic. That's what people like to. And for you to be authentic to what you do, like, do you have some things that you know keep you grounded and keep you as close to Matt as you can be? Oh, that's a really good question, bro. Because and and also you know really something that that I like a word that I like to associate myself with is being authentic and mm. auth- as authentic as possible. So when I go into any situation, as long as I'm authentic, like true to my authentic self, um, which is, you know, keeping my, my values are close to me and also, you know, not, not uh, shying away from the things that have helped build me mm. in, in my past, uh, which uh, has helped me keep, helps me keep authentic in, when I'm in those sorts of modes. So in terms of my photography and all that sort of stuff, um, I guess, I guess one thing that people would know me about, um, as as an authentic, you know, urban UN sort of mat sort of thing, is is my sunset photos. Sure. So, uh, so on our in our flat, we have a rooftop, and um, and you, it's got the probably the best view that that I've seen uh, for a sunset. And over the four years that I've been here, I've I've I have like hundreds of photo of photos and videos just taking them. Um, up on the rooftop, and so people always can al- always associate Matt with sunset with right. the flat, so you know things like that. But if you see, if you have a look on my my Instagram page, there's a lot of sunset photos yep. and or sunrise photos or anything. Um, that's that's got to do with that, and like I guess it all it also comes back to that moment when I was in the hospital room, but right. when I was watching the sunset and I saw the orange, you know, and I'm like shit that that looks beautiful so now i'm in the i'm outside of those four walls and i'm able to you know shoot these photos and videos and stuff in in real life and share them with people so that's how they so that's how they know if they know if they um see a sunset photo or video yeah it's probably me yeah yeah and the metaphor of actually being able to take it outside the window now, like that is beautiful. And just, okay, so the Nguyen flag is gold, the primary yes. colour. Yep, yep. Go into your slam poetry, <laughs> go into that mode. <laughs> yep. And then when you think about sun, when you think about gold, mm. when you put those together, what's that significance to you? Um, the, the, yeah, the, go- the gold of, of New Year is, is something um, quite significant to me also because my, um, my rugby league team, Right. Gold and blue, uh, Man of the Lions. So that's how that's something. Also, my connection to that. Um, but thinking as a creative mind, oh, you know, <laughs> my the son, you know, I've read, written a lot of lines for the for the ladies out there um, Ooh, uh, for, we- with the uh, <laughs> with the we sunset and and all that that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, funny thing, funny l- little story uh, to you know go with that whole sunset and 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 all that sort of stuff. So and. In year thirteen, I I, uh, I thought it was quite cool, so I did a wee ball proposal to um to Auli Cravalho. She was a voice of Moana, right? Um, that that voiced it, and it went it went a bit viral uh, back home in Auckland, but around the country as well. And and uh, yeah, in that in those um in that video and in that you know spoken word poetry that I did, I was just dropping metaphors, bro, with uh, with you know sunset and and ocean and and, and um. And all that sort of stuff, and and that Disney um, one around, right? Yeah, so it's quite, it's quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. Um, and then so something that you know I always kind of admire, and so, something that I admire about anyone really, and this is how I know you're a real one because I think anyone who came down here who just had something to offer gets roped into a special place that we call Patric- uh, Pacific Trust Otago. Yeah. So I ended up, so you know how they do dance fit and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I would go there and do exercise classes yeah. when I when I got here. As soon oh, as they wow. found out that that's what I could do. Really? And then I found out that you ended up becoming employed there yes. to do some work. And how did that come about? Like was it something that you, you like, did they find out about you and then recruit you? Yeah. Because this is, I think people need to hear this because this is what it's like to be 
you know, to serve a Pacific community mm. and to, to do it with humility and to do it to the best of your ability as well. So how did that come about? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, so at the end of last year, uh, when I started my, I started an internship with Pacific Media Network and, um, and yeah, I was able to cover stories. So I met, I uh, cover stories through Pacific Trust Otago. So I met uh, Lloyd, who mm. was the previous general manager at, at PTO, uh, early in the year with our New Wayne Students Association, which we helped um, set up a vaccination clinic at the uh, at the PTO offices in Cavisham. Mm. And that was my first experience. I didn't really know what PTO was or Pacific Trust Otago was. Never heard of them before uh, when I got down there, down here. Um, yeah, so that was sort of the start of it. So I went back in November, December, just covering stories throughout that period of time. And um, in January this year, I got a call from Lloyd and, he's, <laughs> and he rang me. I was in the office at, at P, uh, PMN up in Auckland. Yeah. And he rang me, he's like, hey, bro, how are you, blah, blah, blah. And he just goes, you know, I really enjoyed the work that you did for us, you know, covering stories, helping us covering stories. And I think that's a central part in helping us get our, um, our work that we do out there. Um, would you like to come work with us with yeah. at PTO? And I said, oh, man, I was, I, was quite, um, I was quite taken back about the opportunity. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's really good. Because that, that shows, you know, the work that I've been doing has been noticed by someone else. And, yeah. um, and I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that's no worries. Yeah, I'll, I'll be keen to jump on. So he put me on a, a contract, a part time contract from February to through to like around July, um, while I finished my studies. Yeah. So I was just working part time with them, and um, I didn't re- really quite know understand the work that they did that they did, um, besides from the stories that I did uh, for them yeah. the year before, which was you know helping them with their. Uh, f- uh, covering stories with their vaccination clinics with some of the stuff that they did for food pa- uh, packages down in Balclutha for the families down there. And um, and yeah, in, in July, I started full-time straight out of, after my um, st- studies and I was in the offices 24-7 and that's when I got to, you know, meet our communities, meet our, um, have the relationships with, uh, with the staff members and talk to them a bit more and understand what they did. And man, it's like, it was a really humbling experience, eh? Uh, to be a part of of them, mm. because they've been operating for the past twenty or twenty plus years, you know, with little to, to nothing to mm. work with, and and now they, um, and, but you know, something good about them um, as an organization, and uh, they've just gotten on with it, and I think that's a reflection of our, our our Pacific people, you know, regardless of however much we get or receive, as long as we have something to work with, you mm. know, we'll, we'll still deliver and we'll still be there to help our our people. So just to be a part of that. Um, uh, in daily operations, you know, being around there every day uh, was, you know, it was a blessing. I just finished there a couple of weeks ago as I prepared to move back to Auckland. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think that also, you know, it also gave me a uh a perspective being from Auckland, being the most you know populated Pacific uh, city in the world, mm. uh, to coming down here where there's you know there's hardly any Pacific people down here, but you know they're still. They're still working. They're still thriving, much like you know our, our you know, parents, grandparents, and stuff did back mm-hmm. in the day. So just to see that in person and, and just to be a part of that uh, down here, where they're still developing, where they're still trying to find their feet as Pacific people, yeah. um, it, was, it was a humbling experience. Yeah, that's cool. And what people don't realize, and, and as you pointed out, is that they have little to nothing. Mm-hmm. But the stuff that they have their name next to, in terms of like Pacific Trust, put this on, put this on, put this on. You'd like, they must have a huge team. Yeah. And then you go there and you meet the people who are there and they're just working tirelessly. Like mm-hmm. they just, they just whatever they get, like you said, they, they'll just get it and make it work. And yeah. because of their, you know, longstanding relationships with a bunch of people, that you, that's when you see community. And, yeah. it, and it's such a beautiful thing. And you were just talking about, so you had to finish up there to go to Auckland. What's yeah. happening there? Yeah, so, <laughs> so I was blessed with an opportunity to, that came up um, <clears throat> to work at TVNZ. Awesome. So I went up a couple uh, weeks ago to, for an interview um, up at the TVNZ headquarters. It's quite intimidating in that big building, uh, especially coming from down here where I've, where, where I've um, you know, gotten used to the small town, you know, the small small city and, and working at a smaller capacity. But, you know, going into the offices, I was interviewed and, and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah, so they, they called me a couple of weeks later and said that I got the job. And, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be heading back to Auckland, um, <clears throat> not next week, the week after, so on the 26th of October and, and yeah, I'm just real keen to get this new chapter underway for my um, for for my life. Mm. You know, I feel like this these past four years in, in Dunedin, 
Dunedin has been the most growth that I've ever had to um, take. Yeah, you know, I'd say that even bef- like even compared to my journey through cancer, bro, because um, like navigating adult life is like hard, mm. man, and, and especially navigating life outside of home was, yeah. was real hard. So you know, being able to apply all those learnings, take it all, um, take all of my connections and my networks and my teachings and go take it back to my hometown, um, to TVNZ, and, you know, hopefully make a change there mm. is, you know, exciting. Mm. <clears throat> and is this something that, so, like, in terms of this job, yeah. like, is this something that you just kind of, like, put your hand out and, like, maybe get it, or was there an avenue that kind of set up for you to get this? Yeah, so I, I was, um, so that internship that I did got through through PMN was uh, through the internship program Tupatua. Yep. Yeah. So I was I got that through them, and then one of the navigators in Tupatua, uh, he that um, I've kept in touch with him over the year, and he he got in touch with me. Uh, I, I think um, early first semester, and he said, "Hey, look, there's a there might be an opportunity at TVNZ. I have got some connections through there. Uh, would, would that be interested interested?" Uh, something of interest to you yeah. I said oh man I was like TVNZ oh, that's, <laughs> that's big time man like I was I was downplaying it to myself a lot I was like man that's that's you know unheard of uh, for something someone that looks like like me you yeah know? um yeah so he he set me up an interview with with Barbara Driva and and a couple of the other um uh, journalists Holy. over there yeah so uh it was just a wee zoom where I was I just you know put myself out there to them and they just wanted to get to know me and, and wanted to know my, my background in journalism, but also my background in, in media and and in general. And, um, you know, from, from that meeting, they at the end of that meeting, they said they were really impressed mm. uh, with, with what I was able to, you know, um, show them in that, in that small space, space of time. So, uh, yeah, then it sort of sort of slowly built. And then um, so, so far, his name is, um, he got me in touch and got me an opportunity with um, with – Melody Robinson, sure, and her team, wow. um, which Melody ended up interviewing me when I went up. I was like, man, <laughs> I've seen her on TV, <laughs> man, that's, that's cool. crazy, yeah. And I, um, and funny thing, she came to Otago. She studied in Otago. Oh, true. Yeah, I didn't really even know that. So yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, so she got me in touch with them, and then uh, hopefully, uh, and then, so I'm going to be working with them over the over the summer, and then hopefully, um, yeah, get ready for for next year into a. And uh, straight into it, um, into a full year of full time work. Mm. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Well done. Yeah, Congratulations yeah. on that. That's um, that's a. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a dream come true because I don't know your dreams. But <laughs> in terms of the types of things that you can do yeah. and the access that you have and the role models that you have, you know, of, of melodies of of especially yeah. because of everything that they have to go through, uh, especially like you said, you know, people who look like you, mm. uh, and then things that you can start to put in place. So, you know, for you, what would be? I know five years is a long time, but with this sort of role and in the things you said you want to make a change at some point, like what would that look like for you? Oh, that's a really good question, bro. Um, I think, I think um, one of the things that I really want to do is like, I know a lot of people say it, but I want to take over the world, man. Like yeah. I want to, uh, I feel like where I'm at now in New Zealand, I, it's, it's quite small. Mm. It's quite small. It's always home for me. Uh, it's quite small, but you know, I want to, I want to attack the world and, and try and, Establish myself in other countries, you know, and um, I, my minor, my degree is in French. Oh wow! Um, so I'm, I'm a bit, flu- yeah, I'm fluent in French um, speaking. So I'd love to go over to Europe and and you know sort of establish myself over there, or maybe in French Polynesia as a as a you know a correspondent o- mm. over there. Um, but yeah, in, in five years, hope hopefully somewhere in the world, you know, may, maybe doing photography, maybe doing journalism, but you know, loving life. Uh, it's something that I that I'd love to to be doing uh, mm. down the track, and you know, hopefully be do be able to do more of this, um, you know, sp- uh, speech sort of stuff. Yeah, I'm um, speaking at, at different events, but also you know, speaking at a professional level um, for different corporations and stuff. That that's something that I'd love to do mm. as well. Um, but yeah, just being able to be secure uh, in in myself. Now that I'm older, my priorities are starting to shift. Where I'm starting to think about. You know, fi- uh, like my financial so- stability and you know saving money, which is one of my um my start uh, my mates at, at PTO, um Andrew he he helped me with yeah um with a with a budgeting scheme to sure. to help me because you know I'm I'm young bro so yeah. 
once I got you know once I got my first couple of paychecks, I'm like, fuck, I'm gonna yeah, blow them yeah, out yeah, yeah, straight away. So, um, so yeah, just just things like that. As um, and and obviously the world's changing as well. So I want to be able to to change um with that and adapt my my work in journalism um to you know the the changing world, but also changing world for Pacific as well. So mm. so getting um being a voice for our, for our Pacific people would would be one of the main um also one of the main things that I'd like to to do and it's fantastic and it's, it's it's exciting as well and I think because of the avenue that you're going on and I'm not saying that some jobs are redundant but mm. you know yours is because of the skills that you have and because of how they're kind of you know technologically things are advancing and where you've kind of positioned yourself you know the stories will stay the same but how you get those stories out is what you're going to start yeah. like rolling with and I think the mediums that you've chosen are definitely going to be something that for the long term are going to be you know awesome and, and mm. be there I guess for a long time and it's just how do we make that more accessible for our communities as part of that yeah. um, one thing that I ask everyone on this podcast is just what is something that you do every day or close to every day that makes you feel like you've optimised the day that's a that's a good question I think when um, uh, oh, that's, a, that's a really good question um, I think at the oh, either when I'm in the moment or, or or after the moment where I have a little feeling or, or a little you know breather to myself, um, it happens a lot. Um, after I know that I've I've like you said I've optimized the day, I've done really well, I've had a really good day. Then I'll just sit down by myself and and sit in silence for a bit and just think to myself I'm like, oh man, what a good day! You oh, know, what cool. a what a good time um, that I've had. So um, yeah, that was something that. Actually, I had a really good day yesterday as well. So mm. at, I found myself at the end of the day. I was just sitting on my um, sitting on my chair at home and drinking coffee. I was like, "That was a really good day. Like, well done. You did you did a lot. You accomplished a lot today. So well done." Mm. Yeah, but it's just you know self talk sort of thing that I like to um, like to do to myself to uh, I do for myself to um, to let me know that uh, you know I've I've done well in the day. Yeah. Nice, and letting yourself know. And I think, you know, that's probably something that we should do more of, mm. you know, letting ourselves know when it was a good day because it's easy to get to the end of the day and be like, what a shit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I think that's more of the conversation that we do have with ourselves. Yes. But when it is going good, you know, let yourself know. You've done it. You, you've done good stuff. And then maybe the next day is not as good, but you're still there and you can reflect on, you know, what was it about that? Um, now, that's usually my last question, but when people say stuff that I like, I just yeah. keep going, I'm gas yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'll, we'll try to keep this condensed. Um, so when you do, you know, have that reflection, what is it about a day for you, or, you know, what is it, is it just an internal feeling thing, or are there things that you like to get ticked off, or, you know, what what, what is it about it? Um, I think, I think just, like, often I have a, have a routine. Mm. So if I stick to that routine and I do everything that I set out to do, also I have um, at the start of every week, you know, I list the things that I need to get done uh, throughout the week. Well, whatever time or whatever day it is, as long as I get them done, yeah, then I know that like then um, I know it's been a good day. So yeah, so once I've ticked all those stuff off, or if I've ticked something off on that list during the day, um, then yeah, that that's when I know I'm like, oh yeah, sweet, I'm I'm on track to doing the right thing and and on track to you know. Being productive with with my day, yeah, yeah, no, that's very cool, and I'm I'm happy to leave it there. We've gone, yeah. wow, that went really wow. that went by really quickly. Wow. Uh, but that was an awesome story. I like everything that you've shared today. I'm so humbled to be able to have heard that. You know, just the the depth and and the knowledge that you're able to share, but also just you know seeing yourself go through those different motions and how you've been able to turn something that most people would say is an extreme negative uh, and be able to, you know, put that out there for a lot of people to hear and to be, you know, to just see how anything, I guess, in terms of adversity, if you can overcome it, or even if you're not overcoming it, but you're going through it, that there are going to be silver linings that come out. You just have to be looking out for them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah, truly privileged to have had you on, my friend. I'm really looking forward to everything that we have coming out for you. If you just want to let everyone know where they can find you and follow you, uh, this is your time to do it. Cool. And that's us. Um, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. So uh, it was a really lovely talk. I really like talking about my journey and, and also, you know, hopefully whoever's listening to this can uh, pick some parts out that you really enjoyed and hopefully make your day better or make, um, you know, your future aspirations better. So, mm. yeah, so um, you can find me at, on Instagram at 
Okunam. It's my last name backwards. Um, o u k u n a m underscore, and also my photography photography page, the Urban Yuan uh, on Instagram. So yeah, hit us up if you ever need anything or if you need a any spits of wisdom. Uh, hit us up. But yeah, thank you. I'll make sure I tag everything in that <laughs> as well. Cool. All right then, man. It's been a good day. Thank you.